Hello, I am so excited to introduce our special guest today, Penny Pierce, who is a respected clairvoyant, empath, counselor, lecturer, trainer, and author of 10 books about intuition, perception, transformation, and dreams. And she's known for her ability to present complex ideas in a really common sense, easy to understand way. So I'm so excited to welcome Penny to the show. Welcome, Penny. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Likewise, Penny, likewise. So Penny, to kick it off, how would you define intuition? It's so tightly connected with things like creativity and instinct and all that. But to me, it is, it's really right brain perception that comes directly without language. It's sometimes I just call it direct knowing that you don't have a reason for knowing what you know. It doesn't, it isn't described. It comes in as a full on sometimes understanding of something not just a yes or no or or whatever and sometimes it comes via the senses you know like you get the vision voice vibration uh, you know even a smell sometimes so symbolic um representations that's a big part of it because it doesn't come from the left brain it comes from the other parts of the brain, you know, like the midbrain, for instance, where you would have all the sensory information. And even the reptile brain, where you get truth and anxiety signals and feelings of attraction, repulsion that are just in the body mainly. So right. uh, by, wow. by the time it gets to the left brain, you're figuring it out. <laughs> So you talk about this term intuitive empathy. Can you explain what this is and how it impacts our interactions with others and in our environment? I think that empathy in general and empathic knowing is it's part of the greater intuitive way of being. Uh, it's part of direct knowing, but it's working with the emotional levels and the um, almost, I think, sometimes survival knowledge of the body. Because when you see other people suffering and you immediately feel what that would be like to be having that happen to you, that's a survival thing. You know, you can you contract. Um, we all have it. We're born with it. You know, it's the way we communicate before we have language. But I think a lot of people today are becoming ultra sensitive because the energy on the planet is increasing so much that our bodies are increasing in vibration so much that we're feeling more subtle kinds of energy and knowing what that means. You know, we're discriminating between many levels of subtle things. And um, and so we're we're knowing more about more. <laughs> you know, I call that energy information. You know, that we're we're able to tune in to people you walk by on the street and know if they're happy, sad or sick or um, thinking about a, some kind of a project they're working on. You know, so that empathic knowing is almost like a communion kind of state where you momentarily become one with the other person and you share knowledge or share and knowledge can be feelings. It can be a feeling state or a sensory state. That's energy information, you know. And we do it all the time, but we don't. We aren't conscious of it all the time. Um, so yes. part of I think intuitive development is to be able to work with empathic knowing as a skill, because a lot of people think, no, I don't want to know that. That's too much for me. I don't want to, you know, have the bad stuff. <laughs> and, but there are, it's a whole, it really is a skill set to understand how to become one with and get information and then make sense of it. You don't have to have the same feeling and keep it in yourself all the time. You can have it. Like I think I was telling you in one of our previous talks that I was doing a, a session for someone and I, I was doing it from a trance state where I was really in a deep level. And I started to feel this um, 
contraction thing in my chest level here. And I didn't know what it was, but I was being impressed by energy information. And I said, I don't know what this is. And she said, oh, I have angina. You know, and that's in a way a kind of medical intuition, I suppose, but it came empathically as something that just registered on my body. I always think of it like a Tempur-Pedic mattress, you know, like you make a dent in it and then it comes back to its shape again after you leave. And that's the way I feel sometimes these impressions actually affect us. You know, they come in and they they make themselves known symbolically or energetically and then release and then you're left with that feeling state or that memory of what was that then you put it in your left brain and figure it out you know so it sounds like you know you're taking this intuitive knowledge from your right brain and then making sense of it logically with your left brain. And I want to actually double click on a couple things that you mentioned. And specifically when it comes to connecting with others and kind of becoming one, um, how would you speak about that if you know someone was trying to understand this in energetic terms? So maybe we could just define the word frequency and vibration and how we can gather information from, let's say, you know, the frequency states. Well, I mean, there is a a million gazillion frequencies in the world. You know, everything vibrates. We are here because we have oscillation. You know, we're physical, then we're non-physical, then we're physical, then we're non-physical. We we rock in and out all the time. And so does everything, really. Um, and so we have our brain waves, and those are at different frequencies. And then every object has a frequency. You know, when you start tuning into the vibration of things, like you could have a pure quartz crystal and you could have a piece of mud, you know, and they would be rocks of some sort, but at different frequencies, not good or bad, just the, capable of doing different things. You know, so I don't feel like there's higher frequencies are the best. <laughs> you know, it's like sometimes the slower earthy, deep kinds of things are really helpful and contain a lot of knowledge. If you can go into that level with them at that same frequency, you'll have a direct transfer of knowledge. Same at any state that you want to go to. And it's all done via imagination. By putting your attention on something and then feeling into it to sense what it really is, and does that align with me now, my purpose, what I need to do in this lifetime, what brings me joy? Mm. So part of empathy, I think, is allowing yourself to pick up the frequencies in other people or places. Then relate that back to yourself and say, what, what do I think about that? Or how does that, what does that do to me when I go to that frequency? Because we all have the habit of saying, oh, that person is making me feel bad. You know, they they don't respect me, you know, or whatever it is. But really, you're tuning to a frequency and then feeling what that frequency feels like. So you're doing it. Part of creating new realities is going into the imaginal realm and, and perhaps creating one at a slightly higher frequency than the one you have now. And, and expanding it a little bit, not like hugely where it would seem unattainable but somewhat and then imagine being in it and the imagination of, does most of the work it attunes you so you said a lot and i want to um kind of bring <laughs> Sorry. For the audience because it's really amazing i mean you know so intuition is about kind of listening perceiving uh you know placing our awareness into the field or into objects mm -hmm. or people and kind of getting a sense of of what, what's happening at kind of maybe a subatomic level. Um, and then you're talking about the imagination, which is about setting an intention to, to actually be creative in your reality. So, so those are two very different things. So into, would you say like intuition is kind of about listening and perceiving and then uh, in intention. And I think this is where your work is quite different than what I've read from other folks in the intuitive space, which is that you really focus on actually being able to tune the awareness to a different reality. And so what is that process like for you? If you, let's say you don't 
like um, what you're seeing. And I think you brought this example up in one of your books where you were perceiving a reality in which you weren't happy about the future outcome. And then you started to shift uh, your imagination into a mm -hmm. different uh, frequency state. Can you walk mm -hmm. us through that process for people who are listening? It's a big topic. Um, <laughs> but also I want to mention that I don't really use the word intention that much anymore. I've come to use the word attention, which is okay. present moment, focusing on an idea or a reality state in your imagination in the present moment, and then merging with it by placing full attention, undivided attention on something, you have a communion experience, a connection, a live connection to something, which then you could take it on into materializing that if you want to. But but attention is the key skill of the future, you know, to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it but you get ideas for things you want. Like we did an intention in the beginning, like to say we would love to have this reach a lot of people and help them. You know, and that we do get ideas for those kinds of um, desires, I would say. Um, but so um, now I've kind of lost my way, but I'm I'm thinking that um, working with frequency and and attention and the imaginal realm, to me, the imaginal realm is like the unified field. It contains every possible frequency, all kinds of variables. Anything you want to combine together, you could make a reality out of it. But you do it in your mind first. Like, you know, daydreaming <laughs> is a way that we do that sometimes. We just kind of go, oh, couldn't it be great to like, you know, I love world travel and I love teaching. Maybe I could get my travel paid for by teaching. Or maybe I could go to a whole bunch of countries that I need to see and and teach. And so, yeah, create that reality. I did. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's putting your attention on um, pieces of things that you might like to have in a reality. And then also taking attention out of things. Like, let's say, um, you know, you never quite have enough money. Well, that's a, a repeated kind of um, resistance that you're putting attention on, that you don't have something you want. And if you turn that around from lack more to luck, you know, um, and feel lucky and just start really feeling lucky. And look at what I got today. Look at this amazing reality. Look at how people helped me. Look, at, you know, and start to run that as your new script. It doesn't take long anymore because of the acceleration on the planet for those new um, tweaks <laughs> of your reality to start to materialize. Mm. Can you say more about the acceleration on the planet and? I think you mentioned that the frequency states are kind of increasing. And what does yeah. that mean for all of us? You know, how is that impact impacting our day-to-day -day lives? Yeah, that really is, a, I think, a key underlying thing in almost all the work I do is that, um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and I've noticed year after year after year how everything is speeding up. So I, I really started looking at that and working with it. And um, that's where I got the book frequency from, is that having paid attention to what was happening in my body and how the body shifts when we have these acceleration waves that come in, overwhelm us, and then we have symptoms of either resisting it or going with it to let our bodies start functioning at a higher frequency to match the planet. And if you resist it and clamp down on yourself or clench, you go into pain or you get sleepy or unconscious, you leave your body or there are all kinds of things that we do to try to, you know, if you're in your left brain, you're going to try to fix this. If you just relax and open up or take a nap, you know, get your mind out of the way, the body will adjust itself and you'll find yourself 
knowing more or being more efficient or more loving suddenly, or some of the old things you had that were painful, you can't remember them exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like I've had that where you go, did that happen to me? Or was that, you know, something everybody experiences? Did somebody tell me about that? You know, like, and you kind of, that's your act of letting it go out of your field. You're not holding it, some negative thing to yourself anymore. You're just relaxing and letting things vaporize. <laughs> and Penny, how does that impact our kind of personal health and well being? That's a good question because I think that the more we hold things to ourselves, the more contracted we are. Because, you know, when you hold something, you think it relates to your identity, you know, that that I'm special because this happened or I'm not special because that happened. Um, and you let that dictate to yourself. And then when you hold those contractions, they, they translate into the cells. They translate into the organs and into the fluidity in your body. So when you relax and you open and you let your frequency accelerate in measure with the planet, it's actually, I don't know, it's like going on a low kind of fun roller coaster. So, you, know, <laughs> you enjoy the surprise, you, you, you know, things are revealed, you know. And so in terms of health, I think that that willingness to um, let go of the old as meaningful you know, like, yeah, it's there. You could make it meaningful any way you want, but it it just is what it is. And it might have many meanings throughout your life, like some experience you had. You might interpret it differently as you get older, for instance, you know. Um, but as you relax around it all, then the cells relax, the things open up. You wouldn't probably have inflammation in the system as much. You might prefer to eat different foods just naturally and you wouldn't diet, you know. I, so I think that when you really deeply relax into, I've often called this deep comfort, not superficial comfort, but, you know, all the way through har harmony, um, everything flows. And when you have fluidity, you have health. So, Penny, can you talk to us about, you know, your kind of morning routine or what you do to get into a frequency state that feels optimal for your day and also how you kind of deal with conflict or um, mm -hmm. issues that might arise in your day-to-day -day and and perhaps even a story of how you've worked with uh, a person or a group of people. I love morning and I've recently been getting up a lot earlier than normal and having a lot of quiet time for a couple of hours in the dark <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> um, I don't actually have a lot of personal practices, you know, like a discipline anymore. I used to. But now I, I have a kind of habit of noticing what I notice and connecting with beauty and connecting with um, forms of life that are like the shape of a tree that's just doing itself, whether it's beautiful or not. It's just, you know, it's being authentic. <laughs> and, I, and I get, I entertain myself with those kinds of observations and feeling states because I merge into feeling states a lot. And animals or, you know, insects or butterflies or birds or anything that I see, I can go and be that and feel it. And so I really just kind of have um, decided to entertain myself because I do think self-entertainment is a very high state. <laughs> you know, self-sacrifice is not. And so, uh, you know, and when some somebody acts selfishly or um, egotistically or something around me or on TV, you know, I, I notice it, but they are where they are in their growth process. And I don't have to take that on personally and fight it because I know I'm not that way. But if I can give them space to be themselves, then I have space to be myself. 
So I really try to practice that. And um, I was, you know, I've been writing a new book on money. And um, as I was writing that, the whole idea of gratitude and generosity kept coming up as two parts of something that fits together in a flow that creates flow. And it also is that when I felt into those states of being, I mean, really deeply, like what causes that state, I could feel that those were two states of being that allows the soul to come through. It was just so pure. And so I actually chose, I decided that I was going to change my behaviors around gratitude and generosity as much as I could notice to do it. And that I didn't want to be in any kind of deprivation consciousness anymore. You know, I don't need that. You know, it's a waste of time. So what happened to me was I made that choice to open up and not be selfish and that kind of thing anymore. And about a few days later, I had a heart thing that happened to me. And I thought, this is not, it's like my intuition saved me, actually. I thought, this is not normal. So I called my brother-in-law, who's a really great internist, and described it. And he said, you get over to urgent care right away. And I went in and they took EKGs and all that and said, you, you have to get over to the emergency room. I got over there and they said, we're admitting you to the cardiac ICU. And I went, what? You know, I, I'm fine. It, no, you're having acute heart failure. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so anyway, I was in there for three weeks and I had open heart surgery to replace the, my mitral valve that it blew out. Um, and they say I die almost died twice, but I have no thought of that or memory of that. Um, I felt lucky the whole time. And yeah, it's a while to heal this kind of thing. But I'm, it's like I'm asking for help. I've been lucky. I've been, people have been really helping me. And um, so I, I don't feel sick. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I just feel like what an interesting thing to happen right now because it wasn't on my radar screen. Not in my life was I going to have something like this. And then I did. And then I see it now bit by bit more why me, the soul, did this. You know, that it is a re shifting of everything that I am to be more about gratitude and generosity. And it's like a reset, you know? So we never know what that event is or what that healing is going to look like. You may not even know you need healing. I, I didn't think I did. Um, but this is profound, you know? So sometimes it's people move or they get divorced or they get a new job, you know, or things like that. So, but I think everybody, especially right now, is up for one of these kinds of openings that increase the scope of their life. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you were 50% more of who you are now, what would that look like? Penny, thank you so much for sharing that story. And I'm so happy that you are okay. And that <laughs> thank you, you uh, felt lucky the whole time. That's really powerful. And, and I'm curious, you know, kind of talking about medical intuition, you know, how did you think your intuition played into your experience of recovery mm -hmm. and being able to manage your energy and your body? Right. Um, well, I think I kept a really positive attitude throughout, but there were a lot of things. It's like I, I noticed that a lot of energy was drawn out of my head and needed in the body, especially you have these, you know, this scar, this thing that your chest is pulled apart and you have to heal that and you can't stretch it or hurt it in any way. So you have to have great compassion for your body. And patience, because the phases of the healing process, there are rules. 
and I'm not a good rule follower, you know? And so I wanted, well, isn't it done yet? You know, isn't it over yet? And um, so I had to have that patience and compassion. And then the, you start noticing how every, how the systems in your body are all hooked up together. Oh, is the thing in my brain because not enough blood is getting there or because, you know, like what? And my lungs got congested. I had water in the lungs and then I had to have that taken care of. And everything is so mutually interconnected, you know, and you, I never thought of that that much before. I kind of knew it, you know, but I never felt it. So that was a way of paying attention that's very different. A lot of detail. Right. So, wow. So, Penny, you know, how does our personal environment uh, impact our overall kind of health and well-being? And how how is your kind of personal environment set up for you to have this really fast recovery? Yeah. Um, I think that your personal environment is incredibly important. Um, I don't do well with clutter or too much noise or ugliness or, you know, I like organization. Um, that helps me relax. And, um, and color and design and beauty, I guess. Beauty and order, because I think Life is, in many ways, very orderly. Even messy things have a purpose, you know. <laughs> I just don't want my brain to become like the, the dishes in the sink, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, But yeah, so I put a lot of attention on creating a harmonious environment in each room, in each space, in my car, in the yard, out the windows you know, and um, because I do have this experience that what's around you affects what's inside of you and what's inside of you, you want it to really reflect what you have around you, you know, especially as you grow and, and become more sophisticated in your knowledge, you may want a different kind of house or, or different kind of situation that gets more light or something. You know, so I think we have to stay abreast of all that. So you mentioned also in a, an earlier conversation that there was this former engineer that became a healer that worked all with right. dowsing rods. This was a man in um, the San Francisco Bay Area who has since died. He was an engineer. He retired and he started to pay attention to the vibration of things. And this was way before the vibes started happening in books and everything. Um, but he invented this dowsing wire. It's called a recording wire. It has a little, like, a, I'm going to say a brass tube and then a piece of metal that's bent at a right angle and it spins around in there. Positive, negative. And he started measuring everything, like the vibration of colors, the vibration of the organs, the vibration of illnesses, diseases. I mean, everything you could think of, different emotional states. And uh, so I studied with him for a year or so, and it, it was really fascinating. But he, one of the things that he talked a lot about was that, for instance, the immune system has a particular frequency and vibration. But he discovered that cancer had a frequency that was higher than that of the immune system. So what he developed was the ability to run that dowsing wire really, really fast and send energy into different systems, like to add energy in. And he did that with the immune system and raised its frequency. And it cured the cancer. In the, in the people's bodies that had it when he worked with them, which was a really interesting um, principle, I thought. You know, that if we can even raise our own frequency higher than, you know, cancer to me is something like an anxiety state taken to the nth degree, you know? And if you can go beyond that into your home frequency that I talk about in, 
in the book frequency. It's like, you know, your your original tone, your your core state of the soul in the body, basically. Um, and and run that and keep that going. I think that it will heal many things or create alignments and connections that might have been snagged or something. You know, but yeah, I, I that was one of the first experiences I had with vibration. Um, really affected me a lot. And I also, um, I had spontaneous things happen where um, I was cutting vegetables one night and I cut my finger pretty deeply. And so I, I just took my other hand and I put it on the cut and I apologized. My right hand apologized to my left hand. I'm so sorry. You know, I was going too fast. I, I really didn't mean to hurt you, blah, blah, blah. And I just held it and I pictured the cells that had gotten cut in half or whatever that were, they were coming back together and remembering how they were a minute ago you know and i just kept picturing that that everything was coming back together and that the shock of that wound was dissipating and gone there was no more shock in there so i put a bandaid on it and like 2 days later i took it off and there was no nothing there so i and i've had other healers do some things with me that really shocked me I mean, remove tumors just by putting this guy's thumbs and breathing into the tissue. Uh, you know, instantaneous healing, which I, I guess, you know, you have to have something physically real demonstrated to you sometimes to really let your consciousness know this is possible. And yeah, so how does belief play into that acceptance of you know, kind of spontaneous healing? Uh, I think belief gets in the way um, because I think beliefs are fixed ideas in the left brain about how things are supposed to work or how they should work, you know, and all that. Like you've locked down an idea. And I all this locking down and holding ideas, yeah, this is like old. Right. You know, so I try to, if I... I don't think I have a whole lot of beliefs left. I have thoughts and I have observations, but I'm always willing to be contradicted or to have that explanation in this current present moment. I have an explanation of the cosmos, let's say. And then, you know, like after my heart thing, I have a new one. So I just changed and went to a new one because it's fluid, you know, and, um, so I think that beliefs really can get in the way and keep things from happening. It could be a lot easier, you know. So you speak about um, your home frequency a lot in your books, and you mentioned it earlier. And mm -hmm. I'd love to kind of talk through a practical exercise or technique that listeners can try to develop um, and nurture their own intuitive capacities and connect also with their home frequency. So perhaps yeah. you can walk us through an exercise and then share maybe others uh, with the yeah. audience to practice. Well, first of all, though, I think that your home frequency is sort of the way you like to feel, you know, when you're being yourself, that you're enjoying yourself. And sometimes I think myself into it by imagining I'm playing with puppies or, you know, innocent things that are just kind of childlike often. I sometimes the state has a texture. If you feel into it, like sometimes mine feels like an an angora sweater or a pink, you know, something or other, or butter melting or other. I I talked to a dancer once, and she said hers felt like this. You know, so everybody has a kind of a way of thinking or feeling themselves into their favorite state. So, um, and, and it's a powerful state because when you're in it, you can saturate with it and you can saturate the field of energy around you. 
with it. And even make it go out further and people can walk through it. They can feel you and they may change their state in order to match yours. Or people with the same kind of frequency will start showing up in your reality. Matching, you know, matching frequencies. But anyway, so um, there's one exercise I particularly like. It's working with the diamond light body. And so if you first imagine, you can even do this with your eyes open at the, at the beginning if you want. But standing behind you is the diamond light version of you. It has no blockages. It's it's transparent. It's glossy. And the energy itself is kind of like the clear air on a mountaintop. You know, it's just really fresh. And that is your true self. It doesn't have blockages. It's just the pure essence of spirit and love and wisdom and all that good stuff. So imagine that your diamond light self standing behind your back and close your eyes and feel that he or she is putting their hands on your shoulders from behind. And when you feel that, you you may feel a little buzzy or feel a little higher, you know, frequency, something that feels good and acclimate to that a little bit, and then allow your diamond light self to actually slide into you from behind and sit down with you or stand with you and match up with your physical body part for part so that as you slide in, you have a diamond light brain that goes into your physical brain and diamond light eyes that go into your physical eyes and diamond light vocal cords and a diamond light heart and a diamond light you know arms and blood and just kind of scan down your body and you can have a diamond light inner blueprint of each organ that is totally harmonious and in its perfect state let all the diamond light parts move in. You even have little diamond light cells that are like little points of light. And let them start to come in and take over. And as they do, you'll feel like you can relax, like you don't have to maintain vigilance over everything anymore. That your true self knows what it's doing. It knows how to heal. It knows how to help you do what you came here on earth to do. It has all of that blueprint in there. And it can transfer it almost instantaneously into the cells and the um, tissues and the organs and the bones to every single part. So that wherever you, you have felt pain or disruption in your body before, this will come back in and almost like mend it or fill in the gaps. And it will return things that have felt unloved or disharmonious back to their natural state of being cared for, belonging, uh, you know, feeling at ease. So you go ahead and do that all the way down to the bottoms of your feet and into your toes, into your toenails, into every little bone. And then realize that you are that diamond light body now, and you're here. You're actually present. And you are creating this body. So that your left brain and all of your personalities, vigilance can just relax for a minute or two and allow this adjustment to take place from you, the soul, to you, the personality, and you, the body. And it takes no effort at all. The light that comes in is also, in, in I'm said the words, deep departing, giving you <laughs> the knowledge of who you are, what you're here to do, what you love to do, how easy it is to do it. 
And always it feels easy. Even difficult things are just one step at a time. So you can do this and fill up with your diamond light body. And then, you know, you can open your eyes and walk around and drive your car and go into meetings, but you'll be super clear. So whenever you feel ready, you can open your eyes and come back. Amazing, Penny. I just uh, did a full kind of scan and placed the diamond body into all my cells and organs. And it felt really nice. Yeah. I felt kind of like slow, expansive um, field kind of come online around me. And it's yeah, just... it's and you can radiate that out then too, like your home frequency, and it can just come out all around you and fill up your home, you know, or whatever. It's your field. Mm. But wow. I think we have to, at some point now, choose the state of being that we want to vibrate at. You know, it's like it has to be a conscious choice. Like no more excuses. Like, well, I don't feel good today. You know, like like had this happen. And so now I don't feel good. Yeah. Let's not waste time. That's the way I've, I think things are happening fast now. And we can shift very quickly now. And we can heal quickly. And um, so we need to let go of those habits or beliefs or old programs or other people's ideas that are difficulty based, you know, or deprivation based or suffering based, because a lot of people get identity out of that. And that's just stupid. <laughs> you know, they're just slowing themselves down and stalling. Right, right. Everyone's on their own journey. So yeah, uh, wherever they're at is wherever they're at. And you know, looking back, what kind of things have surprised you the most uh, on your journey of exploring intuition and energy and frequency and working with so many people? I mean, what's kind of surprised you the most? Oh, boy, a lot. Um, I guess, first of all, the engineering of the way my life unfolded, like how things just came at the right time, whether they were really positive opportunities or this thing you would think would be so negative, but it's not, <laughs> you know, you see the gift in the garbage and, um, and, and everything is evolutionary. When I really, really went in and looked at ev everything, it's all for, for us to realize that we are the soul here and now. And we can operate according to those principles that are operational in the spiritual realms while we're here in the earth. Uh, so that really has uh, constantly amazes me. It's like mi little miracles and surprises. Um, but I've also been amazed at people and how they have thought up to like medicate a wound, you know, an emotional wound or how they've tried to, they always try something to get better. And it may be the easy way out and make things worse for a while, but they don't really want to do that. They want the next best step. You know, everybody wants to evolve. And, um, and so that amazes me. And then also um, this idea that you can't tell a book by its cover, that Sometimes people look one way and then inside they're like these amazing beings, you know, like, like I've had some, some very people in very dire straits that, you know, almost like homeless and all this stuff that you would, oh, I don't want to be around them. But no, when you feel through it, they're like these bright lights. Yeah. So, I mean, it takes time to stop and feel into people more and stay out of judgment. But that's one thing that really amazes me. Uh, yeah. What is kind of your big call to action for people listening in terms of connecting with themselves, develop, developing their own frequency, um, dealing with, you know, what's going on uh, with the, ri the rising uh, frequency on the planet? Right. What, what's your main call to action? Well, one thing I think is to start to pay attention to the difference between when you're operating from the left brain and the right brain and the right brain and the heart are very interconnected. Um, 
but the left brain has a particular sound, almost like tinny sometimes. You know, it's, it, I mean, it's ego. If you get too stuck in it, it's ego. And you're separated from people, you know. So when you're in that, don't beat yourself up, but just take a pause and say, okay, um, I'd like to hear from the other side, <laughs> you know, like, um, I think uh, Jill Bolte Taylor, you know, when she had her stroke, she called it in my right mind, right? And I like that. Um, so learn the difference between those subtle feeling states so that you can recognize when you're overdoing the left brain and getting stuck in it so that you can stop, pause, be quiet, open up the other side and get balanced. And that will save us a lot of had hassle and headache um, and accelerate our growth. And then um, part of it is adjusting to the higher frequencies. Like don't blame, don't use blame at all on anything because that just stalls the adaptation, the, the um, adjustments that we need to make. And you can find, you can feel those things. Negative thinking, blame, ego, they're all like things that just kind of, you know, like you can't move yeah. forward with them. So if you can start recognizing those subtle states and then make choices to not make them bad, but, you know, like let's pause and get recentered. And, and the choices, I think, having making choices as opposed to just having thoughts about things, you know, like, oh, yeah, I'd like to lose weight. But making a decision or a choice to weigh 10 pounds less and seeing yourself weighing that much less and not carrying around the extra heaviness and what it would feel like and really working with imagination. Now, that's that aligns everything to start happening. You know, it's a, it's an, a command almost. It's an instruction to the field. But just having thoughts, they just, you know, stall any kind of growth. Amazing. Thank you so much, Penny. Uh, and where can people find you and learn more about your work? Where can they get in touch? Yeah, my website is the best. It's just pennypierce.com, but it's spelled oddly. My first name is P-E-N-N-E-Y. And my last name is P-E-I-R-C-E. -E. So, but there's all kinds of stuff on there. There's a lot of free things and information about my counseling. Um, so I've cut back a little bit right now while I'm recovering, but still seeing people. So, yeah. Amazing, amazing. As always, Penny, you're such an inspiration and I already feel my frequency has lifted just having this <laughs> conversation with you. So thank you so much for your time, especially given the circumstances and thank you for everything that you do. Oh, well, thank you so much for seeing that about me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, no, I, I hope that, um, you know, I think medical intuition is a particular uh, venue for intuitive people, but anybody can use intuition to do healing, you know. Um, but I think, you know, in a way, medical intuitives should be connected to hospitals at some point. <laughs> thank you so much, Penny. And uh, what a great session with Penny Pierce. Uh, thank you all for listening.